Through the spring of 1861, the northern press and public angrily prodded President Lincoln and his government to launch the Union Army into action. The presence of Confederate forces within a day's march of the nation's capital seemed intolerable, and pressure mounted for the Federals to attack, crush the rebels, march on Richmond, and end secession with one blow. In early July, the President, becoming impatient himself, ordered Brigadier General Irvin McDowell, his commander in the field, to go on the offensive. McDowell was desperate. His army of about 35,000 men, forming around Washington, was by far the largest ever assembled in North America, but it was woefully ill-prepared for action, poorly trained, inadequately equipped, and led mostly by old-timers and inexperienced amateurs. McDowell protested his unreadiness to Winfield Scott, the elderly and sage Army chief. Scott pointed out that the enemy, too, lacked experience. You are green, it is true, Scott observed, but they are green also. You are all green alike. Reluctantly, McDowell came up with a plan. He and his army would march westward from the Union camps around Washington, D.C., and clear the Confederates from their positions at Fairfax Courthouse and Centerville. From there, part of the Union force would move on the Confederate army, thought to be camped behind a meandering stream called Bull Run, near the town of Manassas Junction. Another Federal column would attempt to outflake the rebels, cut their main line of supply from Richmond, and force a withdrawal at least to the next natural line of defense, the Rappahannock River near Fredericksburg. The main Confederate force, under Brigadier General Pierre Gustave Toutant Beauregard, was indeed near Manassas, a rail junction that afforded the rebels excellent lines of communication. One track stretched south to Richmond, and another headed west into the Shenandoah Valley, connecting Beauregard's army with a smaller force commanded by General Joseph E. Johnston. In combination, the two Confederate armies totaled nearly as many men as the Federal Army. When McDowell finally sent his brigades toward Bull Run on July 16th, the stage was set for the first great battle of the war. A confused fight, filled with miscalculations on both sides, and a surprisingly vicious one considering the inexperience of the two armies. When McDowell's Federals started westward towards Fairfax Courthouse and Centerville on July 16th and 17th, Confederate President Jefferson Davis and his chief military advisor, Robert E. Lee, were still desperately speeding reinforcements from all over the South through Richmond to Manassas. At the same time, other small units including Theophilus Holmes' brigade from Aquia Creek and the Hampton Legion from Richmond, also headed for the contested ground. Then, as the Union attack loomed, Johnston in the Shenandoah Valley swiftly put his four brigades aboard trains for the 50-mile trip to join Beauregard's army. Probing Federal attacks on Mitchell's and Blackburn's fords on July 18 ran into fierce opposition and McDowell gave up any idea of a direct movement towards Manassas Junction. Instead, he decided on a wide-flanking movement around the Confederate left. On the morning of July 21st, the leading Union brigades of Colonels Ambrose Burnside and Andrew Porter splashed across Bull Run at Sudley Ford, well to the north of Beauregard's defensive positions. Heintzelman's division followed, and reinforced Burnside and Porter, while other Federal units moved down towards Warrenton Turnpike to threaten the Stone Bridge, and still others feigned towards the main fords farther downstream. The Confederate brigades were caught badly out of position, spread over a six-mile front with most troops on the right, where Beauregard was convinced the main Federal blow must fall. Only Nathan Evans, small two-regiment brigade moved at first to meet the dangerous Union thrust that threatened to turn the lightly held rebel left. 
Only minutes after Burnside and Porter's brigades had crossed Sudley Ford and turned southward across rolling, partially wooded ground, Evans threw his brigade in their path on Matthews Hill. There, Evans' small force, vastly outnumbered, held the Federals at bay until he was reinforced on his right, first by B's brigade and then by Bartow's. Together, the three Confederate brigades fought furiously to hold off three times as many attacking Union troops and stalled McDowell's flanking movement for almost two hours. Finally, however, Federal pressure was too great. Porter and Burnside's brigades threatened the left flank of the Confederate line, and Union brigades led by William Tecumseh Sherman and Erasmus D. Keyes that had crossed Bull Run just above the Stone Bridge were moving on the Confederates' rear. By 11 a.m., Evans, B., and Bartow were forced to withdraw the remaining troops back across the Warrington Turnpike and up the lower slope of Henry House Hill. But by then, Beauregard had realized the extent of the threat to his left flank and had begun to send more reinforcements in that direction. The first to arrive was the so-called Hampton Legion, organized and led by wealthy planter Colonel Wade Hampton. His small, 600-man unit was soon followed by the large brigade commanded by Thomas J. Jackson, who led his men smartly through the hot morning toward the slopes of Henry House Hill. By late morning, the Federals had clearly gained the upper hand. The leading brigades had shoved aside the badly mauled troops of B, Bartow, and Evans, and heavy Union reinforcements led by Sherman, Franklin, and others had advanced across the turnpike and were heading up Henry House Hill. With the Federal infantry came powerful artillery support, 20 or more guns commanded by a pair of daring and able officers, Captains Charles Griffin and James B. Ricketts, who deployed their cannon near the crest of the hill and began pounding the Confederate line. But around 2.30 p.m., the momentum shifted. Disobeying the orders of Jackson, who had just earned his nickname by standing like a stone wall, Colonel Arthur Cummings boldly led his 33rd Virginia against the Union batteries. This headlong attack by the Virginians overwhelmed the exposed artillery and routed a battalion of U.S. Marines and the 11th New York, which were supporting the Union guns. Trying to recapture the Union artillery, Vermont and Maine regiments of Colonel Oliver O. Howard's brigade charged up the Henry House Hill, but the New Englanders were soon flanked and routed by Edmund Kirby Smith's brigade, which rushed to reinforce Jackson. Having shifted large reserves to Jackson's left, Beauregard sent fresh troops moving down Henry House Hill and the adjacent Bald Hill and Chin Ridge. Kirby Smith's brigade slammed into Howard's weary men and routed them in what would become known as the Great Skedaddle. Soon, more federal units, disorganized and disheartened, began to leave the field. Now, Beauregard ordered a general attack that caved in the entire right wing of McDowell's army. The federal soldiers threw away their guns and packs and fled, some by the way of Sudley's Ford and others by a shorter route across the Stone Bridge. The retreat soon became a rout, McDowell later said, and this soon degenerated still further into a panic. Beauregard ordered a pursuit, but his troops too were tired, and the Union Army, less 3,000 killed, wounded, or captured, managed to straggle back into Washington over the next several days. The Confederates lost fewer men, however, perhaps 2,000, and yet gained a glorious victory that put an end to the Northern expectations of a short war. If you enjoyed today's video and would like to see more content like this, be sure to take a shot at the like button, subscribe, and ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all the latest bird dog content. And if you'd like to support the channel, for a limited time there's exclusive Civil War Diaries merchandise available in the video link below.